Welcome to Mamas in Training, a podcast that gives new moms guidance and community from moms who have been there. I'm Jessica Lorian, a mama in training myself, so let's learn together all about this thing called motherhood. I can remember standing in my driveway at my house, pregnant with my second. Getting pregnant the second time was kind of that the start of that open door of wondering what is this going to be like and what do I need and how could it be different? And that's really when I started talking to some other women about what their experience was, what the gaps were, what was missing. But my daughter, so she's my second born, she had a heart defect found in utero at her 18 month um, checkup. And so <laughs> in my head, I wanted to have control of a lot of these different circumstances. And I realized that we would need so much more help. I couldn't do it all on my own or I was going to crack and I wasn't going to be there for my family and for my, my kids. Have you ever wondered what postpartum preparation can look like? Usually we hear about depression, anxiety, or weight struggles of postpartum. On the show today, Chelsea Skaggs is sharing the five areas of postpartum that you can start planning for today. She is the founder of Postpartum Together, an online group for newly postpartum women, and she shares action steps that are invaluable. Here's Chelsea. Did I just see recently that, well, maybe not recently, I think it's been going on for a while for you, but I just rec- noticed it. Are, you're living in a camper? Yes. That was kind of a... a, a- goal of ours for a while to like move to all online business and travel with our kids more. And I think I've just come to terms with like, I'm a gypsy soul. The thing that we were talking about today is like the inner growth that has happened, just removing ourselves from some of the expectations and the spaces that we had been a part of. Not that they were bad, but it's hard to grow when you have the people and the voices that expect you in a certain way. So It's opened us up in a lot of ways like that. So you're the founder of Postpartum Together, which Mm -hmm. is an online group for newly postpartum women. Why did you create this space and community for postpartum women? Well, it's what I wish I would have had and what probably would have saved me three and a half years of real internal struggle. We had our first and we had moved. It just was such a quick transition and... There are so many things I didn't share with other people and there were so many areas I didn't feel safe being vulnerable and not being on like cloud nine blissed out mom life because it was so different from what I had expected and so different from what I see projected out there. I felt so discouraged by by feeling like we struggle in silence or we struggle alone because it's too taboo or it's too shameful even to have these sides of motherhood that feel imperfect. So I really put a lot of emphasis on the word together because I think that community, I think our stories are what heal ourselves and other people. So that community-based coaching and information and events was really important to me. So many people equate postpartum to only depression, second to postpartum weight loss. And my entire vision was everything else, the emotional parts, the identity shifts, the, the relational changes. So it's always interesting for me to play with that in my head And and feel like there's almost this other work, the underside work of helping people understand that postpartum is more than depression and weight loss and that we are allowed to make room for the other parts of that transition. And automatically when people say postpartum, they think either a negative connotation connected Mm -hmm. to depression or you're thinking about weight loss and how to achieve or overcome or navigate that. But it's just the time period that you're in. And as I was recently speaking with another mom too, postpartum is not just those six weeks, right? Right. I even saw that (laughs) on what you're writing. It's like, it's forever. We're we're always in postpartum once we give birth. Yes. And I think that's so important and still not understood, which is a barrier for women really giving themselves space to explore their their rebirth in the ways that they've changed in so many different aspects. And that that was true for me. I could only find, as a new mom, I felt like I could find a breastfeeding support group or a postpartum depression support group or, hey, you just had a kid, let's lose weight group. And I was like, oh like 
I need something else that's more in tune and more emotional and more authentic. And it was it was discouraging for me to feel like there weren't buckets for those other aspects. So you have two kids. What did postpartum feel like for you? Well, the first time, I think I was the the model person of wanting to do it all and not need help and not Mm -hmm. connect on any of the imperfect parts. So I was, I was the person putting up only the highlight reels and talking about only the high moments, even if that was a five minute chunk of a hellacious four hours. And I knew I loved my baby and I loved being a mom. I just felt like I was performing all the time. Like my Mm, life for two and a half years was a performance that I felt like I needed to do because that's what motherhood was (laughs) in a lot of ways. And that, that was an isolating part that I then had to pick the pieces back up. I read a quote that you said, there is no badge waiting for people who get through postpartum without asking for help. What made you say that? I think because we, we feel this pressure to do it all ourselves, right? Yeah. And that's that's almost the package we're given at, as what good motherhood is, is being able to do, check off all the boxes. And so I think in a lot of ways, women are discouraged from asking for help or from accepting help, even when it's offered, because that feels a little shameful. It feels a little icky, like, well, a good mom doesn't need that. And I think as a society, we are really not prepared and educated on how to support a new mom. And so we have these aspects of disconnect still. Was there a moment that you can remember where the earth kind of cracked open for you Mm -hmm. or you just felt like this is not how it should be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most certainly. I had some thoughts like that, but the most defining moment I can remember standing in my driveway at my house pregnant with my second And so getting pregnant the second time was kind of that the start of that open door of wondering, like, what is this going to be like and what do I need and how could it be different? And that's really when I started talking to some other women about what their experience was, what the gaps were, what was missing. But my daughter, so she's my second born, she had a heart defect found in utero at her 18 month um, checkup. And so (laughs) in my head... We had had a home birth the first time. I wanted to have a home birth the second time. I wanted to have, you know, control of a lot of these different circumstances. And I realized that we would need so much more help. You know, we we had a NICU stay ahead. We had an open heart surgery coming up. We had a toddler at home. Like we were either, either I had to face the fact that we needed people surrounding us in, in a bigger way. And I couldn't do it all on my own or I was going to crack and I wasn't going to be there for my family and for my, my kids. So that was such a defining moment of, of really, I think, sharing this struggle. And it was the first time I think I vocalized like that there was something about motherhood that didn't feel blissful. It felt scary. It felt like emotionally raw and vulnerable. We were going to need more support and I was going to need more safety in having an emotional experience and having these changes and not holding it all together in a pretty little package. And I think that even on Instagram was when I kind of invited my community, like, you can stay here for this or not, but like, I'm not going to appease you anymore. And how did it feel once you made that shift? I felt so light, so much lighter. And I talk about some of this inner work often at Like we collect throughout our lives, all of these like winter jackets and their, their expectations. They're what this person wants of me or what this season of my life told me I should be. And I consider inner work as like shedding and throwing off all of these different jackets. And that was definitely a shedding season for me. So with regards to staying connected to yourself, how do you think with yourself, you needed to take a minute, step back and recenter? Mm -hmm. Two things that I probably knew about myself, but I couldn't run from anymore. One, I like to like go in overdrive and just perform and put out and take care of instead of stopping to listen to myself. That has been a, a lifelong pattern. And I wasn't, 
I wasn't able to do that. There was so much I couldn't control. We literally had to slow down and learn and take in and and be with other people. The other aspect that I wanted to touch on was, again, that I don't have to do this myself. I think as as a as a driven woman, I'm an Enneagram 3, which is the achiever. I get a lot of fulfillment in not having to ask for help and for putting things out there and for achieving. But I really had to step back and think about how that doesn't necessarily mean I do it all on my own. Absolutely. I saw an article that you wrote regarding, you know, friendships after baby. Mm-hmm. And so Where did that play in? How did you have to reconnect to the friendships that you had to either create and comfort and build that community or to have maybe some friends be, you know, the friends that you call to laugh and, you know, not have a part of your your mom group? How did that develop? Well, this was so, so different. And I can like feel it in my heart how different this is between my two. So first time... Mom's going to do it. Performance mode. I was able to, you know, connect with people at library play group, going for walk friends or, or park meetup friends. And those were really important people in my life then. But I didn't necessarily get to the heart of things and the more vulnerable side of things. Distinctively, the second second experience, I was very intentional about connecting in a deeper way. Probably her first year of life just looking at what our support was like. It, it was probably a smaller group, but a very a much more intimate group and a group of people in my life that could continue to really invest in us and, and we invest in them and it feel it feel good. It doesn't feel like you're in debt to anyone right. when you give. It just was a very natural flow. Absolutely. I mean, I even feel as a mama in training, someone who's not yet a mom, that over the years as I've grown up, my friends have sort of taken on different paths. Isn't it so interesting how when you're five or you're 10 or whatever, you have that best friend. Oh, yeah. And then even maybe in high school, you know, you have your like top best friends. And then you get into this time of your life that you realize, oh, this friend I I call on for this and that friend I call on for that. So reading that article that you posted, it was it was touching to me even not being a mom yet because it's so true. And there's a place for everybody, right? In in your life and in your journey to support you. Yeah. Now, what about your connection to your partner? How did you find during that postpartum time that you needed to adjust to make that connection strong? Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is the most difficult part of my transition after baby. It was, it was very difficult to find how we worked together, you know, when, when your partner is taking on a different role or piece of the puzzle. But again, this performance mode and wanting to do everything right and be, be a a super mom in these ways, it was very me centered and then baby centered. And I think I really saw my partner as like the third wheel. I could provide for my baby. I could take care of my baby. That was, that was really a pride, pride point. And I think I kind of wrote off the needs that my partner had, the way that this had rocked everything in his world too. I think I didn't give myself permission to acknowledge it in myself so if I couldn't even do that, then then I didn't have room to acknowledge these changes in his life and to really try to connect on that way. So it was a rocky road for a while, and I just didn't feel I didn't feel connected. You know, intimacy was was a hard part because I was touched out and resentful sometimes that he would get to leave the house and talk to adults and I didn't. Or, you know, if I had said in my head, I wanted this done (laughs) and it wasn't done. There, there There's so much we could go into there. But I think the the point is that was a really unexpected change. Uh, And we just didn't have that preparation. We didn't know to think about and prepare for how we needed to be a team and how much things would change and how we did connect and communicate and have routine and how we shared ourselves with each other. I read in an article that you said, not saying what you mean causes a lot of trouble in communication and relationships. Mm -hmm. And of course, with your partner, a hundred percent. So 
Do you remember a specific time where you experienced something like this and how you sort of were able to flip the switch and how you approach it now? Hmm. I needed more affirmation in knowing that what we were doing was okay. And I remember him, you know, complimenting my body and really wanting to be close and just just loving how that had changed. And I was like, there's no way. Like I had no (laughs) confidence in myself. So I couldn't hear that. I couldn't receive that at that time. And I think the same goes like, I needed some more really practical, this is good, or you did good on this, almost like like an elementary report card or something. Yeah. And that's my love language, like words of affirmation. That's that's what I need. And I also distinctly remember this night, like we, we came back and we revisited some things from before baby. We revisited our love languages and talked about how we needed to integrate those more. And again, mine is words of affirmation. His is physical touched. I was touched out. Like I did not want him to need me and to need that connection, but, but he did. And I wanted to honor that and provide that connection, even though that would look, it looked different than it did pre-baby. And the same, you know, I needed that affirmation. I needed, I needed someone to help me build my confidence. That's really interesting for you to say, because it's not necessarily the things that we're asking for from our partner or from our friends or whoever it is in our support team, it's not necessarily that you're saying to ask, I need you to do a night feeding Mm -hmm. or I need you to clean the bathroom or I need you to prepare dinner. It's, I need you to tell me that you saw that I fed our baby today. Yeah, and we have to teach people how we communicate, you know, and how we communicate together And you get into one way of doing that. And then a baby really does change that. So Jessica, that made me think of just this morning, my husband and I, like we did this little relationship retreat thing this morning. So we like set the kids up with a movie. We were in another room doing that. But before we did, I thought to like clear the kitchen table because we knew when it would be done, it would be lunchtime. So let's get everything prepared for that. And Literally after I did that, I was like, hey, honey, I just want to tell you this is what I just did. And I need you to tell me that that was really that was a great (laughs) idea. And that was really helpful. Now we can we can teach each other. We can advocate for ourselves and and it doesn't feel shameful anymore. But I remember it feeling really weird. And that's a beautiful part about, you know, this is all elements of postpartum. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily what you typically hear about, but it's how those intricate details all come together. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so beautiful. We touched a little bit on intimacy, but is there anything that you would say to pregnant women or new moms in preparing, we've talked about how they can start this communication now. Mm -hmm. I think that would be the most important thing. Mm -hmm. With regards to intimacy, how can you prepare for for that change? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first thing is that you and your partner have to understand that a six-week checkup and your doctor saying all clear does not mean that you're ready to like run home and have sex again. That, That message that has come from somewhere is so harmful. It's so harmful to mamas I work with and their partners having this kind of like timeline and expectation. And I think it does such a huge disservice to like what intimacy and sex means for us. And so that's my first, like I I teach a postpartum planning course. And when I talk about relationships, I'm like, okay, number one, if you have not told your partner, if your partner (laughs) thinks this means Mom is coming home to like right. get in the, it's not, it this doesn't have to mean that it might, mm-hmm. but it doesn't have to. And I think the other thing, and I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but this, but it's communication. It is having, you know, I teach my clients to have such clear, almost feels like dumbed down communication. Mm-hmm. So that might be developing a list of intimate things I'm comfortable with right now and intimate things I'm not comfortable with right now. And you put that list together with your partner and you figure out what makes sense. So for example, I had a mom and she loves back rubs, but every time, you know, her partner was like, ah, is this back rub leading to sex? And she's like, I can't even enjoy back rubs right now. I can't enjoy this because I, I just have this like back mind anticipation or or expectation. So we have to be so Mm -hmm. clear. I'm okay with this. I'm not okay with that. And I think that goes for any time in your relationship. And then also set, these are the no-go times. If I'm just coming, it's the first hour I'm coming home from work and I need to decompress. It is always a no-go. Do not (laughs) 
<laughs> approach me, you know, or yeah. whatever it is. So I think in order to say yes to things, we have to know what we're saying no to. And this reduces, and it goes both ways. This reduces the rejection that we might feel, you know, this re- reduces the the tension that's there. And specifically in sex and intercourse, communication is huge because things feel different. They look different. Everything is different after having a baby. And so if you can't communicate with your partner, this area is tense or this position doesn't feel good anymore, then you're you're not going to be satisfied with the experience. So I guess the moral of my story is you cannot simplify communication too much. And it can feel really silly to have to have conversations with someone that you've done life with for years, but your circumstances have changed and you have changed. And so you have to revisit those conversations, these foundational parts. I mean, I think that's an amazing tip for, for all. I mean, I can use it. I need it. (laughs) I'm like, okay, husband, when are we going to have a conversation? (laughs) But I mean, that's something that even during pregnancy, of course, this Mm -hmm. might not be talked about, but Mm -hmm. Your body's changing Mm -hmm. and you're going to feel how many hormones in nine months, like, (laughs) right? And so at the beginning of your pregnancy, you might feel a certain way toward intimacy. And then in the middle, you might feel a different way. And then at the end, you might feel a different way, Mm -hmm. be it like, let's go for it or Mm -hmm. no, not at all. And Mm -hmm. all those ways are appropriate and are acceptable and are right just for you. And you just need to communicate those. Yeah. Yeah. If I could I tack one thing onto that too, the the logistical conversations and the like, we're intentionally going to spend time together. Date night sh- probably shouldn't happen at the same time <laughs> either. Mm-hmm. So yeah. when you're ready to start these conversations intentionally, we have one night a week that's a check-in. It's like a logistical check-in. And we say what's working, what's not working. This, you know, this might be about the home. This might be about intimacy. This might be about the work schedule. All of these things. So if you have a a topic that needs to be covered, that kind of goes in this like family meeting family session. meeting <laughs> yeah. session. Yes, which cannot be the same as date right. night or you know that set aside time for each other. Ah, oh, that is so beautiful. You talk about postpartum preparation, including you know setting yourself up for success with life after baby and that transition to home and beyond and all of that. You've already given us so many wonderful tools and ways that we can prepare, especially with communicating with friends, family, connecting back to ourselves, and then our partners. But what are some other ways that mamas in training, pregnant women, can really prepare themselves? How can they create that postpartum plan when they don't even know what to plan for? Yeah. So I like to break postpartum into five categories. So we can kind of walk through those. Mental health. So knowing, do you have a history of mental health or did your mother, grandmother, you know, the women in your lineage have a history of mental health? And just being aware of that, just starting to educate yourself and educating your partner about what some of the red flags might be that you need to be aware of or identifying what some of your triggers might have been in the past. Emotional is a lot of the things that we've talked about today, knowing what fills up your cup, knowing how you connect with friends, partners. You know, I even have some of my mamas like write out the friends that you would call for different things. So you just, you take the thinking out of it because you don't, you you don't have the brain space afterwards to to (laughs) think through all of these things. Go to your cheat sheet. Okay. This is how I'm feeling. Who can I call? (laughs) Yes. The same with, with, with knowing, you know, who your providers are. This is kind of the logistical side you know, research a couple lactation consultants or postpartum doulas or sleep consultants, whatever. That doesn't mean you have to hire them right then, but it takes some of that work out of when you're really emotionally depleted and you're exhausted. You already have, like you said, that cheat sheet set out. Let's see. We talked about mental, emotional, relational. So we've talked about so much of this, having these conversations preemptively, knowing your love languages, maybe even writing out some topics that you and your partner enjoy talking about. Which again, to some people, you're going to be like, why would I do that? Like, of course I know what we like to talk about. But when the moment comes that you're exhausted and the baby 
sleeps 10 minutes later than the nap time you anticipated, then you have a time to have a conversation. And there are so many times we sat and looked at each other like, what do I even, what does my brain do? Like, what do I think about? What do I like? So having, having those in place. The Five Love Languages is a book. It's by Gary Chapman. And I've read it. It was a long time ago, but I'm sitting here thinking, hmm, I should read this again (laughs) and do it with my husband. I remember one time, like years ago, we were on a long drive somewhere and I pulled it up on my phone and I said, hey, let's take this test. You know, it's a really good thing if you're ever driving anywhere or, you know, I mean, there's some of us have a lot of time during this COVID time. <laughs> but yeah, so I wanted to make sure everyone knows that that it's a book. That's what we keep referring to. And it's yes. really wonderful, not only for your personal relationships, but you know, like we've been talking about all relationships in your life. So sorry to interrupt you, but I wanted oh, to make I sure people I love that. Know. Thank you. Yeah. So we said that there are mental preparations, there are emotional preparations, there's physical preparations. I did not learn about my pelvic floor changes and functions until I was pregnant with my second. So the entire time that I was having painful sex or leaking when I was working out, like all of these things, literally no one taught me. There's no one Mm -hmm. in charge of teaching us about our physical recovery. So you have to seek that out. I'll throw in a little plug as well to episode 53 of the pumping podcast, Uh because now we're mamas in training, but episode 53 of the pumping podcast. So you can just look back in the previous episodes is with Nikki Bergen. And she Uh is the founder of the bell method and the bump method. And she talks all about pelvic floor and her workouts are so incredible. I actually just started this week, one of her bell method workouts. And yeah, I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's my pelvic floor. That's how I should be contracting my abs just in a general workout. Like, holy moly. So definitely if you haven't listened to episode 53, jump over there after this one and check that one out because Nikki is full of amazing info on, on all things pelvic floor. So yeah. yeah. And, and not only for our healing, but it's a huge disservice that we as women aren't educated on our bodies, you know, specifically our vulvas, our vagina, and our, our pelvic floor. And so if you are pregnant, this is the perfect time mm-hmm. to get to know your body. And that impacts the birth experience. That impacts your postpartum. All of these things. Get to know your body and, and the birthing experience and be empowered by that. There's There's so much empowerment in us understanding ourselves more in that way. The, the other area, we did physical, mental, emotional, relational. So we have <laughs> personal, personal identity, which is, it's kind of like the relational side, but reminding yourself of how, how do you feel like yourself? What can you do on a tough day? What makes you, you, what drives you? So I mentioned another kind of online quiz thing, the Enneagram, which I'm a, if, if you explore that, I'm the type three, I'm an achiever. So I knew again, that I needed to know that my husband saw my achievements. I needed to feel accomplished. I had left the workplace. So I didn't have employee feedback. So I knew that I needed to build something into my life eventually, you know, when the time was right to, to do that. And for me, for, for a short while, that was just, I was being a VA and I did some work for other people online, but I got to do things and I achieved them. I accomplished them. I had something to show and I had someone else to give me feedback. And that was just really important for my identity. I know that's something that drives me. So knowing yourself, whatever that is, being able to come back to, to what makes you really feel like you. And it's not self-care in the sense of go take a shower right. or yeah. go you know, <laughs> to the bathroom by yourself. What connects you back to you? Yeah. Yeah. And even how do you relieve stress or how do you get joy or what is it? So I like to tell the story of as a, as an early teen and a teenager, I loved like loud music. At first, that was like locking myself in my room and just dancing it out. That became (laughs) taking a drive with the music loud, the windows down, like just screaming. Usually it was Since You've Been Gone by Kelly Clarkson, like belting it out. That's that's just a way that I relieve stress and I feel good and I feel alive. And so, you know what I did two weeks ago, I took a drive and I blared the music and I put the windows down and I just yelled. And that was was so cathartic. 
cathartic? Yeah, cathartic. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what is Wait, that word? Is that? Cathartic for me. <laughs> yeah. And and so sometimes the things that were really helpful for us in earlier seasons of our lives are things that we could revisit and implement again. That's really smart because I know that there are definitely some things that I can think of right now that, yeah, just made you you, you felt alive in yeah. those times and for yeah. whatever reason age, adulthood, whatever, you kind of push those under the rug. Mm -hmm. We have been talking now for so long and all of these elements are elements that are never touched on. Like we mentioned in the beginning of this episode, we touch on losing weight, we touch on the depression, but there's how many different categories did you say? Like I have, five, yeah, five, five, five that I work with. Five different categories that are all so equally powerful mm -hmm. and important I just think if there's an ability for pregnant women, mamas in training to really grasp onto this beforehand, yeah. of course, there's going to be those moms. I have a, f a few friends of mine that are just like, I'm going to fly by the seat of my pants and we're going to see what happens. And that's great. Mm -hmm. You do you. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking to kind of prepare for that, this is just such an amazing, amazing opportunity to dive in. Chelsea, if you could go back in time and tell your pregnant self something, what would it be? It would be to turn less to blogs and social media and Google, which feels strange because I'm a content creator, but to turn to those less and trust my intuition and those closest to me more. I'm sure I w wasted hours as a new mom on Google and trying to figure out how to do things right when a lot of times I, I knew inside what was best for me and my baby and my family, but I, I just wish I would have trusted myself and my intuition more. Absolutely. A hundred percent. We're born with this innate intuition that can get so clouded in this day and age, right? Yes. Yeah. Chelsea, how can people find you? I am at postpartumtogether.com, postpartum together on Instagram and on Facebook. So all things postpartum together. And I just found last night this amazing guide that you have called 10 Things People Don't Want to Tell You About Postpartum. I went ahead and snagged it for Yay! myself. I'm not going to give it away for everybody, but I'll just tell you too. It's longer than a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. postpartum is, and you still have contractions. Mm -hmm. So right. if you want to learn the other, right. But seriously, like, I didn't shocking. know that. Was a, I mean, something that we need to know. Yes. Yeah. So if you want to learn the other eight of those amazing, important things that people don't tell you, go over on to Chelsea's page and get that guide for yourself. It's Thanks. been such a joy. I've been wanting to talk to you for so long. Such a but pleasure. But the way that the world works, I think this is the perfect time. And I'm really okay. just grateful to have, have spoken with you. Thank yeah, you so much, Chelsea. Thank you. If you enjoyed the show today, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And leave a review on Apple Podcasts so I know how to better serve you. I'd also love for you to join our community of Mamas in Training on Facebook. You can find me at Mamas in Training on Instagram and at mamasintraining.com. For Mamas in Training, I'm Jessica Lorian. We're in this together. <laughs>